Thanks everyone for uh, dialing in this evening. Um, go to the next slide, actually, Pavlina. Um, just to introduce myself, yeah, I'm Neil Herman. Um, I'm the portfolio manager, fund manager for uh, Henderson Smaller Companies Investment Trust. It's a role I've had for uh, 22 years now. Um, all that time at Janice Henderson, and then prior to that, I was at Morley Fund Management. Uh, now of Eva Investors for 10 years, so 32 years experience in small cap. Um, in terms of my team, uh, the two pictures are my colleagues. So um, Indri Van Heen um, is deputy fund manager on the trust, um, been with me since um, 2013. Um, and then Shiv is the most recent colleague who joined us back in um, uh, 2017. Um, so over 50 years experience, combined experience in, in the small cap markets, very established and, and uh, kind of um, um, a kind of stable team. And obviously work at Janice Henderson, it's a very, Big organization over 350 billion global AUM and some people have mentioned here we interact with in terms of the skills and expertise of knowledge they bring to the party but in terms of really constructing the portfolio and picking the stocks and running the fund it's the three of us that are the key individuals in, in terms of that process um if i just start off uh, my next slide really um just talking about the pitch for small cap um so look this is a you know a kind of essentially kind of why why, why would you bother um, and the really the, the kind of the 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 essence here really is the returns you can make, um, demonstrated by this graph here. This is a very long term graph. This goes back to 1955, and this is really when um, Dimson and Marshall, the old London Business School, um, can, or kind of back tested the um, the kind of their own perception of what small caps do. Um, and you know, going back from that time, you know, a thousand hundred pound invested back in 1955 would now be worth eight hundred thousand pounds. A similar investment in large cap worth 136 so clearly kind of like almost a six-fold return of, of small cap over large cap that equates to an average outperformance of 2.9 percent per year every year of, over that kind of um a, a 75 year period so um you know clearly small caps have provided um phenomenal long-term returns for investors the reasons for that i won't go through in detail but listed on the, the left hand side of the page there but the ability to grow from a smaller base is clearly more easy than um, kind of a larger base and clearly the law of, law of kind of small and large numbers. Um, now, let, let, let's be, you know, just to kind of back on that, you know, although small caps have provided excellent long-term returns, we do know in essence they are um, more volatile, um, more prone to the economic cycle and less liquid. So it comes with caveats. If you take a very long-term return, being very, very good generators of alpha and, um, and value creation, but you do get more kind of uh, volatility in the short term. And just on the next slide, just to try and explain the differences between large and small cap and why that actually is. And really here, you've got the kind of differential kind of sector exposure of what you get with the small cap. And we define small cap as the bottom 10% of the UK market by market cap. So think of any company below about one and a half billion market cap being in our investment sphere. And if you look at it, the sector composition of small and large cap is very different. So, you know, in small cap, you're going to get much more economic sensitivity and cyclicality. So we're going to have much more companies in areas like engineering, electronics, media, software, retailers. And, you know, we know that the large cap market is dominated more things by banks, farms, pharmaceuticals, um, telcos, for example. So small cap is, is very different to large cap. Um, it's very much more different sector composition uh, and in essence, a bit more cyclical. Um, and that will explain some in terms of what performance has been in the last few years. Um, if we go to the next slide, just to run through some of the dynamics around the trust we're talking about today, um, you know, you know, this is our our product, and this is what we're talking about. What is the, the trust? Well, it's a, a listed investment trust which invests in smaller companies. Size-wise, reasonably large and liquid. Um, at the end of September, market cap of nearly 700 million. NAS is over 700 million. Um, so a decent sized trust in, in terms of its liquidity. Uh, fee structure, um, low base fee, 0.35% per year. There's a performance fee payable, uh, but only if we outperform markets, as you'd expect, and also produce positive total returns. So, you know, we are very much aligned in that context. And the fee is capped out at 0.9% in any one year. Um, we pay a yield um, or dividend. Um, we've seen very strong growth in that dividend over the over my tenure. Um, and I'll come back to talk about that a bit more detail later on. Um, performance wise, again, we'll talk a bit more detail about that. Um, got a good long term track record. We've outperformed in 16 of the last 21 financial years I've been in, been in charge. And then a differential feature of investment trusts compared to an open ended uh, investment company is we can gear. 
um, and gearing has been used to positive impact over the course of, uh, of my tenure. Um, gearing was around 13.6% at the end of September. Um, it's currently now sub 11, actually, um, so come down a bit in the last um, month and a half. And most of our debt is provided by long term, um, quite cheap debt, which we took out in the last few years. So 50 million of our approximately 80 million of borrowings is by um, long term private placements, which means our debt costs are, are relatively low. So that's really a kind of a kind of a, a kind of over review of the trust and um, some of its features. Um, in terms of the top of talk about performance, um, and we get to the next few slides, which are kind of put in by compliance. Um, but if we go to slide um, eleven, it must be. Sorry, you've got the wrong slide. Keep on going. Sorry. Keep on going. Keep on going. Keep on going. And again. And again, yeah, so this is looking at performance of the trust um, over a variety of time periods. So you can see there the kind of the long term track record of the funds. Um, you go back to my kind of since I joined back in October 2002. Um, it's a good long term track record, a returns of 13 percent compound per year every year of that 22 year period bidding our benchmark by an average of 2.2% um, per year. Um, so good long-term track record. Um, the more medium-term track record of three and five year, clearly more challenged. Um, really, that was impacted by what was happening in 22 and 23. Now, why was it as difficult as it was? I think there's a number of features about the market in that period of time. Um, so, you know, what was happening globally, we obviously had um, Ukrainian conflict starting in February uh, 22. We had the hangover from COVID. We had um, supply chain issues around COVID and the dynamics of um, kind of um, from from China. Um, we had challenging UK politics, political environment. Um, it includes a period when this trust was, was prime minister for 42 days. We had the cost of living crisis, but principally the major impact on markets was the interest rate cycle. Uh, and we obviously moved from a period at the end of um, 21 when central bankers all thought inflation was transitory and rates weren't going up to a point when obviously rates rose extremely quickly from essentially free money to um, rates of, at the peak of five to four, you know, five to five and a half percent. The impact of that is clearly a, a, a slowing down of economic activity, which impacts corporate profitability, but also um, the valuation of growth companies. And we'll talk about how we, you know, we are a growth investor. So our companies derated in that period of time. So if you think about a company's value being the future sum of its cash flows, and if your discount rate is higher, those future cash flows are worth less. Because you see a derating in our, in our portfolio. So it really wasn't because obviously our companies did badly operationally. It was more about the valuation the market was willing to place in it. They had a, a more challenging time, which accounts for that kind of more um, a challenged uh, medium term track record, particularly in 22 and 23. Encouragingly, I suppose in the course of the last year, no, it felt hasn't felt amazing, but it's been better than probably I kind of I, I've been uh, feeling under underlying um, as as markets have key um, as we've seen inflation peak, interest rates peak, and start to come down, and the market become more rational. Um, we've seen better performance. So the last year you can see there that we've produced a total return of um, nearly twenty five percent and beat our benchmark by around five percent. So a better short term performance, but you know you've clearly got here a good long term track record a more challenged medium term track record and short term it's, it's certainly picked up. Um, so that's, I suppose, really about history and performance. I suppose, look, how do I think about the future? And look, let's go to the outlook. And I suppose, you know, what are we thinking about markets who stand today? So in terms of the next slide, um, you know, the UK, as I mentioned, has had a, a tough time um, and small caps have had a tough time in, in the last few years. Um, so how are we thinking now? I think if we drill down to the micro fundamentals, either the, the, the things we think about our own companies, um, you know, in generally good place. Um, corporate profit performance has been pretty resilient. Um, so our portfolio grew its earnings by around 20% in 22. It was fairly flat in 23 and growing this year by about mid single digits. So that you know you're still seeing profits grow in a challenging economic environment. Um, balance sheets are strong. Dif you know, differential to to the global financial crisis in 2008-9 when debt was very high. You know, debt is actually very low at the corporate level. Um, around 40% of our portfolio has got net cash. Um, but there are some technical you know, issues currently going on with, with earnings forecast. You've got FX. Um, sterling strength is not good for overseas earnings or translation of overseas earnings. And recent changes in the budget regarding national insurance, we'll come back to a bit more detail, will lead to some kind of pressure on, on corporate profitability. Um, macro wise, um, you know, look, I think the positive is that inflation has, has peaked. Um, 
we're back into the kind of central bank range where they're targeting inflation and that's allowing interest rates to fall so we've seen clearly a cut in the us cut by the ecb we've seen two cuts in the uk um, and they're likely to continue to fall going forward into the rest of this year and into next year and that's positive for both stimulating economic growth but also the valuation of the companies we invest in as those kind of rates come down that they should should move up um, however to be fair the global economic macro picture is still quite challenged and we go around the world you know Europe is in a quite a challenging place currently. The UK economy is growing, but slowly. Um, and we did see UK business and consumer sort of confidence dip into the budget. Um, China is, is kind of a, is, is struggling a bit currently and throwing up a degree of stimulus at the equation. And obviously the US is has slowed. So it's a challenging environment out there at the moment, um, which does lead to that kind of pressure on on kind of um, on on the kind of core profitability we're seeing from our from our businesses. Um, I think. No, like any fund, UK fund manager, I can tell you the UK market is cheap. Um, you know, it's very attractive. And I've got some slides to demonstrate that. So I think, you know, we are very much the view that the valuation our portfolio trades at is extremely attractive. Um, but that's, I suppose, you know, not particularly different. What are the catalysts to change that? Uh, well, I suppose, first off, we, you know, you look at it, there is significant corporate activity in the market. Um, you know, we are seeing a lot of M&A, inward M&A into the UK market as overseas corporates and PE buy up what is a cheap market. So we think that will continue. Um, we are seeing dividends continue to grow. So, you know, the dividends we're getting as our as investment managers from our portfolio companies are still continuing to, to grow into the future and obviously providing us a good stream of income. But also we're seeing, in, if, in terms of my career, the highest level of corporate buybacks we've, we've kind of seen. So I've got a, a kind of fair portion of my portfolio currently buying their own stock back. Now, why is that? Um, a, because their balance sheets are strong. Um, then they are in a very good position from a, uh, from a kind of financial perspective. And they recognize their inequity is cheap. And clearly, logically, that would mean that they would you know, buy back their inequity because it's un fundamentally undervalued. And then I think also what's different again compared to you know the last couple of years we are we have got a pretty stable UK political environment behind us. Um, you know the periods of UK exceptionalism are kind of somewhat over. So you know if you go back again a couple of years ago, UK inflation was in double digits. Why is UK different? They've come back into the norm. Um, we have interest rates coming down in the UK. We've got a Labour government, um, a very sole majority, which they got in July. Um, you know, that doesn't mean we've got political stability going forward. Um, and to be honest, in comparison to the rest of the world, that looks looks a good thing. I mean, you, you compare to Europe, with the mess that's going on in France and obviously Germany, um, at least we have that. So I think from a kind of a, the UK has suffered from a political discount in terms of the um, perspective on how markets are the thing. And I think that's kind of probably moved on. We're now in a very stable environment going forward. Um, and that that's going to certainly uh, kind of a positive thing. Um, and if we just turn to the next slide, um, you know, let's, let's talk about the elephant in the room in terms of the budget and what we saw there. Now, I think, you know, to be honest, it was mixed. Um, as I said before, there was a lot of anticipation of this budget. It was a big gap between the election and the budget. Um, and a lot of things being, flights being kind of, kites being flown about what could happen. Um, and, uh, yeah, I said before, business confidence and consumer confidence did dip as the concerns around the kind of economic black hole that, um, um, you know, Rachel Reza talked about, you know, was very much in the, in the in the front line of the press. So, what did this budget really entail? So, first off, it was a I suppose a tax, spend, and invest budget. Um, bigger numbers than we might have expected. You know, kind of thirty five billion of tax raises. That money being clearly being spent um, on um, things like education and the NHS to, as she said, fix the foundations. Um, but also quite a big amount of um, change to fiscal rules, allowing a significant investment um, in some of the areas of public infrastructure. Um, now that taxation burden I talked about mostly fell on business and and wealth type taxes, so things like business property relief and capital gains tax. But clearly the big thing was in the employers NIC change, um, the move from 13.8 to 15 percent, and the change of bans. Um, now you know ultimately that's a cost for business. Um, and I, you know how will they recover that? A kind of three ways probably or four ways. Well, first off, I think there'll be an element of trying to raise prices. So this budget, in essence, is inflationary in that aspect, as companies try to recover some of those extra costs by putting prices up if they can. Um, the other impacts will be trying to pay their staff a little less um, or pay them a, a lower increase next year than they might have expected to do, given that pressure they've got, but also potentially employ less people, you know, efficiency savings. 
but the net net of that probably there'll be still some impact on corporate profitability from from the changes to employers at NIC and I think it'll impact clearly those businesses that employ a large amount of lowly paid workers so you think about what areas are most impacted it's going to be things like hospitality retail and sports services but every UK business will have some cost increase from that we clearly saw post the election or post, post the budget sorry uh, guilt yields rise um a because of that inflationary impact of um of um of the kind of the NIC uh, increase but also because of the quantum of bond issuance likely to come so you know clearly the, the view that obviously raising taxes didn't cover the full amount of likely spend going forward so we'd like to see more bond issuance or more guilt issuance and therefore guilt yields have risen um and that inflation impact probably means the bank of england will um, reduce rates at a slower pace overall than they were previously so the market expectation of the rate of decline in interest rates is probably less than it was. Um, now that's all uh, kind of you know probably kind of a more kind of certainly kind of not great news. I mean, on the, on the other hand, I say you know what was you know I suppose positive. There was clearly a concern ahead of the budget that they were going to the Labour was going to completely remove um, BPR or IHT relief from AIM AIM stocks. And AIM had performed very poorly um, up to um, up to the budget from the basically when the election was called because of that fears. Now clearly they did they did obviously change the um, the, the relief they cut it in half from forty to twenty percent, um, but at least they kept some relief there. And we saw clearly that AIM underperformance did reverse quite sharply um, on the day of the budget. And we saw you know a big rise in AIM the AIM market on on the day. Now I think in essence I suppose you know if I were to strap it as going forward. Now, AIM is clearly going to be a less attractive market now. I mean, the the LSE has changed its listing rules and takeover rules, which means that the advantage AIM had has now been dissipated on those those measures. So its only real advantage was that um, the kind of the IHT relief. And I suppose does 20 percent really cut it uh, in terms of the risk you take from a kind of IHT perspective? So we do think, over, you know, this will probably be a negative for AIM over the, over the longer term. But in terms of where we invest, um, we invest in much more the kind of large end of the AIM market. Um, and therefore, we'd expect a lot of our AIM companies to, over time, and it will be a trickle rather than a uh, kind of torrent, uh, to transition to the main list, um, which in, in some ways would probably be good be good for them in, in, the, in the longer term. Um, so, look, you know, the budget's done. You know, there was a lot of con concern and uncertainty beforehand. We know the, the impacts, the uncertainty is removed. Hopefully we can move on from this, but I do think the kind of the, uh, the actual kind of measures they took um, were pretty mixed for the UK market overall. Um, so let's try and bring some of those other points I mentioned earlier to life in some sort of um, slides. We turn to the next slide, and the next two slides are really trying to bring to life the kind of perspective in terms of um, the operational uh, stability of the portfolio. Um, and this is a kind of a looking at the 22 and 23 period. Um, it's our top 20 stocks. Um, the first column is just showing you what the absolute share price performance was between that 21 and 23 period. Quite a lot of red there, as obviously markets were very challenged. But, you know, what was the reality on the ground regarding the growth of these companies? And you see there, that's the second column. How much did the earnings of these portfolio companies grow during that period? And predominantly, you can see it's green. So our companies were growing, a few negatives, but mostly positive. So what does that mean? You know, Yes, the market was very challenged. You saw the rating of growth companies during that period of time because of rising interest rates. But fundamentally, um, they were actually doing pretty well operationally. And the, the kind of consequence of that is the third column. And that's really how did the, the kind of the valuation multiple of those stocks move during that kind of two year period. And you can see there that 18 of our top 20 stocks derated. I got cheaper during that period of time. And you can see the kind of the, the kind of the, the, the fall in the fall, the final two columns, the quantum of the fall of the some of those valuation multiples during that period of time. So look, I mean I think with you know, you know, let's be honest, Mayor Culper, I think valuations have got overextended at the end of 21. They did reflect a, a decade of free money, but the derating we have seen over the last two years have been savage and is a really a function of the valuation, not the operational performance. And if we turn to the next slide, just trying to bring it more up to date. Um, again, same chart. You know, again, our top 20 stocks at the end of June this year. Um, and you can see there how you know, markets have been in more positive mood during the course of this year, um, particularly in the last 12 months. And so you can see the first column is the kind of the share price performance in that kind of the six month period to the end of June this year. Predominantly green, you know, markets were, were kind of in a, in a positive direction. 
Um, so that's good. Um, you know, we're seeing some recovery in share prices. But the second column, again, is, you know, well, are these companies still growing? And again, predominantly, yes. You look at it there, you see predominantly green. These companies are still growing their earnings. It's the forecast growth in FY24 from these portfolio companies. So, yes, share prices have been going up in the course of this last um, year. But we are seeing companies still continue to grow their profits. And that, again, the third column is while they're getting more expensive or, or cheaper. And it's very mixed picture there, really. So in essence, even though markets have recovered in the course of the last year, things have not got more expensive. So the, you haven't missed the opportunity from a valuation perspective. And again, if we think about, you know, the long term impact, you know, long term here, really, if we think that interest rates will come down and maybe they'll, they'll settle around three and a half to four percent as a natural neutral rate. And if you were to add an equity market premium of three and a half cent on top of that, you can justify a no growth evaluation for a, for a company being about 13 to 14 times earnings. Well over half of our portfolio trades below that, and we are a growth portfolio. So we do think there's a lot of value in our underlying portfolio. And then just, I mean, I talked about valuation, about the kind of the cheapness of the UK market. I've got a couple of slides here. I can, I can the UK fund manager could probably give you 50 slides as to why the UK is cheap. But I'll try and talk about our portfolio. So the first slide here really is just looking at the the average forward P multiple of our portfolio, um, um, and that's the orange line, um, and then the black line is our underlying benchmark. And so we can see there that you know we are trading at you know six year lows, um, around six year lows in terms of the uh, kind of the valuation of our, our portfolio, and a very small payment to our underlying market. And given we are a growth portfolio, that's 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 surprising. And then the next slide just looks at, you know, the kind of context of how small caps have done. Sorry, next slide again, sorry. Um, uh, you can see how the small caps have done. And, you know, you know you can see here how, how badly small caps have done in the course of the last few years compared to large caps. And this isn't just a UK thing. This is obviously international. You can see here that, you know, UK small caps and European small caps have been trying to, you know, be each other in terms of how cheap they become. Um, but trading at you know 35, 37 cent discounts to um, to large caps and even U.S. small caps, again um, look cheaper to U.S. to U.S. large caps. So you know this is a global situation. You know the small caps have become you know have been derated over this period of time. They've certainly become cheap versus large caps, and that's a feature that because small caps tend to do quite poorly in terms of economic distress or difficulty. And as interest rates have risen, that's been a global phenomenon. So we do think you look at it there, the small caps. Do look very very cheap from a long term perspective compared to large caps. Um, next slide, just that, that point um, I made earlier about the M and A activity, um, and you can see here clearly that um, you know you know this is the kind of a, a list of the major major M and A inward M and A in the UK market in the course of the last um, a few years. And I suppose what's interesting here is you know who's buying. You see from the flags there, it's typically overseas or private equity. And again, that's a point about them seeing the value opportunity in, in the UK market and exploiting it by buying up some of our businesses. And clearly, obviously, we don't like to lose good companies, but if people are willing to pay us the right price for them, we can really take that money and recycle it into other, other good investment opportunities in, in the UK. And then lastly, I suppose, just to pick up this point about, you know, again, elephant in the room regarding flows. Now, you know, um, you know the UK market has been, sorry, next slide, sorry. Um, is you know it, it's been clearly a, a market which has seen big outflows since 2016. Um, you know we know the reasons for that: um, pension fund de-risking, um, the removal of kind of a tax relief on pension credits. Um, but you know that chart on the, the, side, the left hand side just shows you how unpatriotic our UK our kind of own domestic pension funds are. You know we're underweight; they're underweight the UK market. Um, and the UK market essentially is a um, a flows driven market and you know the, you look today there's been a big outflow which has been another reason why the uk has underperformed and small caps underperformed um you know what changes that um well i think we did see encouragingly in the kind of the middle of this year flows start to improve um as sentiment started to get a bit better in terms of the uk equation um you know i suppose it got a little worse recently pre the budget as people you know certainly took risk off the table um but i think the, you know, another key catalyst could be the mansion house speech on thursday um, again, Rachel Reese will stand up and then obviously talk about kind of um, how to try and you know, accelerate investment into the UK by pooling of um, kind of uh, local authority pension funds, but also potentially uh, mandating a minimum requirement for equity hold UK equity ownership in pension funds. So we do think there's some potential positivity regarding flows getting better into the UK market into the medium term. Um, so 
just that's really about an outlook. Just like, like the last slide, and says, you know, so just next slide. Um, just in terms of, you know, looking again a longer term picture here, and I suppose the opportunity set. Now, you know, I said before, clearly small caps have had a, a challenging last two to three years. Um, but, you know, as I said before, in the long term, have outperformed and provided very good return for investors. And you can see here that actually the period of performance we've seen, the underperformance in small caps is quite, you know, reasonably long it goes back to, to back to, to 20 basically 22 onwards but the the kind of the returns you can make from small cap in periods of economic inflection are very strong so you know when do we make the most money it's a period when things materially move so for example back in 2003 after the um, after the tech bubble burst um in 2009 after the gfc the extreme performance you can get so you know essentially what you do tend to find is that um you know small caps tend to you know will perform very well in periods when economic activity picks up, but also they'll anticipate that recovery and move ahead of it. So, you know, fundamentally, I think if you took the view that the world gets a better place as rates come down, um, a small cap should benefit very strongly from that equation. Um, so that's a bit about the outlook and where we see things. Um, you know, pretty balanced view about where we are. If we just turn about next in terms of how we do things in our portfolio and how we pick stocks and construct portfolios, um, this is a process. Sorry, it's a busy slide. And I'll run through it quite quickly, but in it's a very consistent process and approach to investing in small companies. Um, top down, we are growth investors. We do believe investing equity is about growth, about the future. Um, but we are we are kind of GARP, so growth at the right price, growth at reasonable price. We do think valuation is important. We are long term. Um, we average holding period is over six years in the portfolio of stocks in the portfolio. Um, we are investing we call quality companies. Um, and we have a very much bottom-up stock picking approach. Um, in terms of the quality criteria we choose in terms of our approach, we talk about the four M's being the key there, and these are the characteristics what our companies to demonstrate. So what are they? Their business model, I have a strong business model, an economic franchise, competitive advantage, uh, Porter's five forces, SWAT and the business, strong management teams who we meet on a very regular basis, get to know them very well, assessing their track record, their vision, their motivation, their corporate governance, align with the shareholders. Third M is money, um, and that's around about um, the, the balance sheet strength um, and the cash flow dynamic of the business. And then lastly, momentum, trying to find companies that will deliver strong earnings momentum. So we are four M's criteria, very much the way we pick stocks in terms of our quality criteria, aligned to the, make sure the valuation stacks up and they, they kind of work well from both an ESG and macro perspective. It's a bottom-up stock picking. Um, we reach about 100 stocks in the portfolio. Strong sell disciplines to ensure we maximise the gains we make, and strong risk control process in place. So overall, yet yeah, this is a kind of a growth, but quality growth at the right price, uh, long-term and bottom-up portfolio. And uh, bringing that to life in terms of um, a stock. So um, no, I suppose, sorry. Next slide. Sorry. What what should you expect from this that process? Well, I think you should expect a fairly diversified portfolio and. Here's our top 10. You can see here a range of stocks in our portfolio, portfolio. Um, you know, things from a house builder to a mortgage provider to electronics to media. So a variety, kind of variety and a kind of, um, a, a kind of a, definitely a kind of um, a, a sort of a, 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 a kind of a, um, a kind of interesting sort of, you know, top uh, portfolio positioning. Um, you should expect our portfolio to have a mid cap bias. Um, so we tend to focus our attention into the, towards the um, the top end of our universe, given liquidity considerations, but also we see value, um, but also diversification from a stock perspective and also international uh, exposure. Um, and so just I'll try and bring this to life in terms of the next slide, just talking about a stock in particular, to hopefully give you a feel for the sort of things we look for in a company. And I've picked Keller, which is an addition we've made uh, during the course of this year. Um, so what is Keller? Um, you can see from the pictures here, it's involved in construction. It's basically a ground engineering uh, services company. So it does the, prepares the groundwork for construction contracts, so piling, foundation support, un, uh, underground ex excavation. It's a global business. Go to the next slide, sorry. Um, sorry, next slide. Um, thank you. Um, you know, it's a global business, operations in the US, uh, Europe, and the Middle East. Why do we become interested in it? Um, well, you know, I think what we saw is this business had had a, a challenging last decade, um, but new management team came in back in 2017, 2018. Um, they brought a new discipline to controls around bidding um, and pricing, and they did a lot of work in terms of tidying up portfolio, 
and really started improving their financial performance. But the major you know, attraction here, not only was that dynamic in terms of improving fundamentals, but also the opportunities in, in the US as business provided. Because predominantly, although it's global, around 80% of the assets or the earnings of this company come from the US. And we're seeing big investment in the US in terms of the infrastructure investment, um, the IRA Act, the IJ, IIJ Act, um, and the CHIPS Act, a lot of investment going on in the US. So this provides a great opportunity for us to get exposure to that, to that kind of um, that opportunity. It also provided, you know, was in a very cheap valuation. Um, so when we um, acquired the business, we were buying it on essentially around seven times earnings. And what you've seen since then is the company has over delivered in terms of market expectations from an earnings perspective. They've grown their earnings um, uh, quite dramatically over that period of time. And you've seen that share price performance perform very well. So if we go back to our four ends and how it fits. Um, so from a month, sorry, just keep staying with the, sorry, the previous slide. Alina, sorry, thank you. Yeah, just in terms of the kind of the um, the the four M's. So in terms of model, how does the company fit? Yes, strong market leader, uh, good market position, 16% global market share, biggest, um, twice as big as any other its competitors in, in the global market. Management team done a really good job improving the fundamentals of the business. New team come in, really improve things. Um, you know, very very good, good track record. Money, very much so. Strong balance sheets. Um, uh, leverage has come down significantly and generated a lot of cash. We we're going to start to return capital to shareholders. And the earnings momentum, the last M, very, very strong. So, you know, I think it's been a really good investment for us and it's something we'll clearly try and replicate with, with other ideas, but gives you a good, a good idea of how we how we look at the market. And then to the next slide, um, you yeah, know, this is obviously transaction activity in the course of this year, Keller being a new addition, but obviously other ones we've been buying this year, things like um, our financial software, leasing uh, software business, Dominus Pizza, which I'm sure you're familiar with, FRP Advisor, which is a restructuring con consultancy, um, Keller, um, Morgan Sindor, a diversified construction business, um, Trust Pilot, the review agency. So a lot of new ideas out there. There is a good opportunity in the UK market. We're seeing a lot of opportunity in, you know, in terms of new ideas we can we can um, kind of add to the portfolio. We're not seeing a dearth of opportunity in our portfolio overall. Um, um, so, yeah, let's, what I just... Um, Last thing I want to talk about next slide is really about just kind of it's a kind of slightly strange thing from a UK small cap growth trust, but it's about income. I think it's very important to to shareholders. Um, you know, so this is you know looking at the point is you know we are investing in essentially profitable cash share and dividend companies. We think paying dividends from our portfolio companies is a good thing. It's a good discipline to have. Um, the benefit of that is because they're growing. Um, they should be paying us growing dividends every year, and therefore the income into our portfolio is growing year after year. And then we give that back to you as shareholders as a dividend. Uh, said earlier, we have a, we do pay a dividend. Our current yield is over three percent, and this just pays just looks at the long term track record of our dividend. And we last year became an, an AIC uh, dividend hero. I, that means we've grown our dividend by twenty percent compound. Oh, sorry, it's, it's grown it, um, we've grown it every year for the last twenty years. And this just chart shows you the orange line is if you put a thousand pound of the HSL the day I joined back in 2002, what annual income would you have received on your initial investment, that reinvestment? And you see that that the orange bar has grown dramatically. Also, it's going to be also your thing. Oh, green bar. Sorry, excuse me. Green bar has grown dramatically over that 20, um, 22 year period. So from a very low starting base, you now be yielding, you'd be now be generating 334 pound of income on your initial thousand pound investment. Um, so 33% yield on cost. Um, compare that to the all share, which is perceived, perceived to be a, um, a high dividend paying um, index. And obviously you start from a much higher base. So the yield on um, the initial thousand pound would have been um, 37 pound, I 3.7%. But the growth has been much less dramatic at that period of time. And it's probably tripled over that 22 year period. Um, so you see there the growth in our dividend of only 22% compound at that period of time compared to the all share of 4.5%. So, you know, it's about, you know, the, the, the dynamic of a investing in a profitable um, set of uh, companies which are growing their dividends can be very, very attractive from an income perspective. And you can generate, if you're taking a long-term perspective, very strong income returns. Um, and just, so next slide, sorry. Just, I mean, I'll just try and I've taken up my more than enough of your time. Um, just to conclude, I suppose, really, look, I think, um, what if, you know, why small cap? Um, well, I think I tried to explain that earlier. I think the long-term returns of small cap have been very attractive. Um, they have clearly outperformed large cap by a very material margin. 
We don't think that small cap effect has gone away. We think that's still going to be a feature into the future. We know that in the last couple of years has been more challenged, but we don't think that kind of that dynamic has changed in the longer term. Kind of why now? Again, I think I will run through all those reasons. I think, you know, the portfolio is operationally strong and soundly financed. Um, it's it's derated materially. The valuations are compelling. We're seeing a lot of m and activity. Companies are buying back their own stock. They think it's cheap. Um, UK politics are stable um, and a better place than some of the other European markets. And small companies have underperformed materially in the last two to three years uh, and therefore provide a significant opportunity to re-rate and perform well um, if economic conditions improve. And I suppose why us? Well, I suppose you've got a, a pretty stable team, an established process. I mean, that that process slide hasn't changed for 22, 22 years. We are very consistent in our approach overall. Philosophy hasn't changed. We've got a you know a good long-term chart record, and we believe the kind of the the pro-cyclical tilt and the growth dynamic of our trust. Um, and as as rates start to fall and economic income activity picks up, um, it should lead to good performance of the trust overall. Um, so that probably concludes what I want to say, um, and, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Neil. Um... So uh, a good run through, and we've uh, you've stimulated a lot of questions already. Yes. So uh, so that's a good sign. Uh, just just picking off those uh, one at a time. Uh, again, just a reminder: just keep typing away. But if you do see uh, a question that looks pretty similar to your own, uh, give it the thumbs up, and I'll deal with those first. Um, First one up here from Ian Richards, uh, quite a popular one from everybody. Why not base the fee on market cap? rather than nav in conjunction with board then have greater you, you then have greater incentive to reduce the discount <laughs> there's one uh, for you uh, i think uh, well, it's probably look, more I mean, a board question but uh, more a board question than my question i think i mean it's convention i'm not really aware of many products that actually charge on uh, on market cap i mean for example our OIC, our sister, you know, can open any vehicle is clearly a kind of a, an, an asset value perspective and i think it's very hard in some ways you know for us to influence the the, the, the discount, I mean, I'll clear if we, you know, our discount current is around twelve percent. It's varied between over my tenure, crikey, it's been be between sort of, you know, we trade at a premium for a very brief period of time and you know twenty five percent. You know, and really, it's influenced by kind of the, the kind of the the dynamic of buyers and sellers. So it, it'd be quite challenging to do that. I, I think the convention is to charge on NEV and that's very much the, the way we've gone forward. So, I mean, we are clearly keen to reduce the discount. Um, it is a focus, um, you know, very much the case of we'll do that through performance um, and marketing and getting the message out there. And occasionally we have bought back stock to do that, uh, but it's very hard for us to influence it because it's really about the dynamic of buyers and sellers. When, what circumstances would stimulate a buyback in your view? So, yeah, we I mean, we so look, I think if you, again, if you, again, a long term history, we did buy a lot of our own stock back during the first decade of my uh, tenure. Um, and that was really a function of, I suppose, higher discounts at the time. Uh, but also the shareholder base was very different as well. So we had to really move the shareholder base away from what's a very institutional shareholder base to try and encourage ownership by more the private client wealth managers and the private individuals. So, for example, now our two biggest shareholders are um, Interactive Investor and Hargis Lansdowne, I, lots of underlying individual investors. So that dynamic was very much in place. But I think what we did find during that period when we bought a lot of stock back during that kind of, dec that kind of first decade or um, period of time is that it has no influence on long term discounts. Um, you can influence a discount tomorrow and maybe in a week's time, but actually it has no impact. What you, How you generate a lower discount is by performance and marketing and getting people um, kind of much more committed on the medium long-term basis. We did mm -hmm. buy some stock back recently. So I go back a few months ago. Uh, and that was, a, and again, this is a, a board call rather than my call per se. So it's, you know, I'm obviously, I'm not a member of the board. So, you know, I can obviously, you know, have a conversation with them, but it's their decision. But with the view was taken that we were a double discount at that time. So not only, you know, you look back, you know, that period of time, the share price was, was a bit lower. Um, so we had a portfolio and a big valuation discount, but also the discount to NAV was approaching mid-teens and it's come in from that level. So that was a kind of opportunistic thing to do that. And we will be very much alive to that opportunity going forward. Uh, but I suppose the fundamental view is that, you know, that buying stock back will not impact the long-term discount. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm, interesting. Um, just, uh, I did actually see this this week. Uh, one One Trust has announced that they're going to use share price as their uh, okay. basis for fee uh, for fees in f going forward. So maybe that's the beginning of a trend. I don't know, but uh, um, yeah, it's. Bad. I would say it's not convention to be honest. Actually, um, yeah, um, yeah, very much the case. We've always charged fees. I mean, I got if I go, goodness, I go back. Um, I've got a feeling actually we changed the fee structure in probably the middle of the the noughties. And I, from, as I remember, we were charging fees on gross assets, um, which intrinsically was wrong. So, you know, mm -hmm. we did, did move to the point of charging on net assets, and that's been the convention. And certainly, I, 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 I'm i aware from my, the, the wider perspective is that is the virtual convention charging net assets. Sure, sure. Okay, well, the, the second question, actually, the second most popular question was very similar, is should your fee be share price based rather than net based, thereby aligning all our interests? So that's from David Major. So I'll just, um, so there's two questions along the same lines there, but we'll um, we'll move on. Is it an explicit objective to retain AIC dividend hero status? Um, look, no, there's not an explicit requirement to do that. Clearly, it's a, we're proud of the fact that we've managed to grow our dividend 20 years in a row um and that that chart the page we showed regarding the dividend growth is a kind of chart we we really like because obviously that's you know reality that we've actually you know compounded our dividend by 20 over 20 percent over a 22 year period um and the return the income returns to share has been very very strong over that period of time um i think you can imagine that having succeeded in getting aicc standard uh dividend hero status we're unlikely to want to give it up so you can imagine that we'll probably continue to grow our dividends in the future. Um, but that should be driven by the underlying dividend growth of our portfolio companies. That's that's what's driven dividend growth over the last 20 years. It's not been us trying to manufacture it. It's because we've invested in growing, profitable, dividend-paying uh, companies. And as they grow and their profits grow, logically, they should pay us a higher dividend. And therefore, clearly, we should then return that to you as shareholders. So growth in dividends going forward i'm not going to say we're growing at 20 percent compound that's been quite exceptional but if if our underlying companies are growing then our dividends should be growing and our dividends to you should be growing too so i think it's it's highly likely that we'll very much be keen to retain our dividend hero status and grow dividends into the future okay thank you um next one up was uh, from colin hughes um uh, are you are you as worried about the future of Warren Buffett apparently is? Thanks, Colin, my ex colleague. <laughs> so, uh, um, so look, um, look I, I think there's always worries in terms of um, the future. I mean, yeah, there's always things to get concerned about. Um, you know, the global geopolitical environment is challenging. We've obviously had a change of government in the UK. We've got a Trump presidency in the US with whatever that brings and you know, the next four years of chaos potentially but a lot of you know different mandates he's got um so there's always concerns out there uh, i suppose we have to drill back to the fundamentals in terms of the of the portfolio and the companies we invest in um and um you know we're positive about the micro and those businesses and their ability to withstand those kind of those things that are kind of uh, thrown around um so you know there's always going to be things to worry about if there's not then yeah, that's that's just not stock markets basically um and you know the world does look at uncertain places at this point in time but that provides opportunity as well and i think we just have to stick to our knitting and think focus on the fundamentals mm -hmm. okay thank you um one from adrian coles here you mentioned um aim armageddon um is it your view that the aim relies on tax breaks well i think beforehand i mean if you go back a couple, two or three years ago, AIM had an advantage in the sense that it was a, a kind of less regulatory oversight and it was easier to list and it was easier to raise capital to do acquisitions. So there was that dynamic alongside the tax break. Recent changes by the LSC on the main list have taken some of those technical dynamics away because it's now they've really leveled the playing field in terms of listing Listing requirements and M and A and, and issuance term uh, issuance. So, some of those technical advisors of AIM have disappeared. You are left principally with the the IHT relief being the bedrock of AIM in that sense, really. Yeah. H hence, why I think that it's likely that you'll see um, a number of the larger AIM companies transition to full list. 
um, because there is an extra credibility of that. And what you lose the IHT investors, but you gain the trackers in terms of the of the being a full list. So, um, I know, for example, you know, one of our bigger holdings, Gamma Communications, which is you know top ten holding, has already announced they're going to they're going to move from that, and they're a one and a half billion pound company. So, I do think the larger end of aim probably will be under some degree of pressure to go to the full list. I don't think that's a negative per se. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think in some ways, in some ways it will help refresh the main list in terms of new companies coming to it. So, and I said for where we invest, I think AIM will still remain a market and probably for the kind of small end end of the market cap range. But some of those bigger AIM companies will probably move move to full list. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there've been a, an awful lot of companies delisting or going being taken private, acquired, or whatever in the AIM market in the last few years. So, the, you know, it's, it's a dwindling. Uh, opportunity set these days do you think that trend will just continue then as uh, more companies upgrade to full listings and uh, small companies continue to be acquired or or yeah. delisted it, it's i mean that's the point is i mean I suppose that's a like concern about the opportunity set i as an investor have and I, I do agree over the course of the last three years you've seen a shrinkage in the uk market in terms of the number of companies because mm-hmm. you know we've you know seen some delisting but also quite a bit of m a activity and corporate takeovers in the uk um this for me is a cyclical rather than a structural issue um it's really the fact we've just seen not it, historically we've always seen a degree of m a activity in the uk market yeah. um it's because we just had no ipos so we've seen a dearth of you know, new companies come to the market in the last two to three years and that's really because of the fund flow perspective so fund flows into our funds in terms of our ability to invest uh, but also because of the, the you know, small caps have performed poorly and therefore it's been quite difficult to generate the confidence to invest in new businesses. So I do think, you know, when markets improve, there's a, there's a log jam of stuff waiting to come. We're aware right. of that. We're aware yeah. of that from our kind of contacts in the investment banking community. Not to be too cynical about it, but investment banks make a lot of money from IPOs and they're very keen to get that whole train moving again. Obviously this year we saw Raspberry Pi list and that's done very well. So it's, there's, there's, there's companies out there. Just think we need to see, you know, market confidence return, um, and people start to make some money again, and that will then free up that IPO um, pipeline, and then we'll get a refreshment of the market. So I'm not, you know, huge negative on the kind of the, the opportunity set. And again, as a previous slide in the pack, we talked about the number of new companies who added to the portfolio over the course of the last year. We've got a lot of, there's still a lot of things out there we can invest in. Um, but I do think we need the IPO market to, to open up again. Okay, thank you. Uh, one for me and Richards here about the cycle. Do you think UK cyclicals will outperform if unemployment starts to rise? Um, so it's one of those things, and I suppose really, you know, I think that small caps tend to do best. And I mentioned earlier about the the kind of different dynamic of small caps from a sector exposure. They are intrinsically more cyclical from their nature. Um, so we do need to cycle to turn. Um, small gaps don't do very, don't do well in recessions. So if we're talking, you know, if we're talking soft landing, that's absolutely fine. Um, you know, if we're seeing a mild rise in unemployment, um, you know, slower economic growth, um, and rates start to continue to fall, that will be a positive dynamic for small caps. If we see a, you know, a severe recession then that's clearly going to be bad for small caps. Although a severe recession, the consequent impact of that would be a much more rapid decline in interest rates and the start of the next cycle. So, you know, mm. it's, it's, mm. it's recovery delayed rather than recovery postponed forever. Um, mm. So, yeah, look, I think there's, you know, I think if you look at today, you know, I think small caps are more prone to the economic cycle. Um, you know, soft landing is a much better scenario for us than a hard landing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, Taha Dohadwala says here, um, is asking, is the trust trading on a premium or discount, which I think you've kind of answered already. It's about 11 12. at the moment. 12. 11, 12. 11 yeah, 12, 12 discount. Then they ask yeah, it like. yeah, 12% discount at the moment. Uh, but then he goes on to say, and why? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. So that's always, a good question. It, What's it, the always, answer to that? It always has been. Um, small cap trusts tend to trade at discounts to NAS at value. I think it's a perception of the underlying illiquidity of the equities that we hold. Um, probably unfairly, to be honest, given you know, we're investing mostly in mid caps um, and large small caps. Um, so, I mean, 
trust tend to trade tend to trade at discounts to their underlying asset value. Small caps tend to trade at slightly higher ones, but perceive the liquidity of the trust overall. I suppose the the idea is if we to wind the trust up, there would be a cost of that in terms of the, uh, the kind of disposing yeah. of the, the of the all our underlying investments. I could we don't wind it up, and hopefully you don't wind it up too. But I mean that is both a concern. Yeah. But yeah, we've always traded at a discount. A discount moves around. Um, I said before, I think the you know I think if I would go to the kind of the biggest discount was on was forty percent in the very dark days of of the global financial crisis, um, and we were literally in a premium for about three days after Boris Johnson got elected in twenty nineteen, and then COVID came along. But you know um, our discount has trend tended to trend in over my twenty two year tenure. And a low double digit discount, that's not out of kilter with long term averages. Mm -hmm. And how does it compare to the peer group in the small cap world? Um, Very similar. Similar. Okay. Similar. Yep. Okay. Um, one here from Tom Dury. You have mentioned share buybacks by investee companies. How does this impact return of cash to shareholders through dividends in your portfolio over future years? Are we moving that's to the US market position where share buybacks? A primer is a primary method of returning cash to shareholders. It's a really interesting question, actually. Uh, I do think that if you think about the the way companies return cash to shareholders, um, we have seen companies not prioritise but um, buybacks over dividends, but certainly change the the kind of dynamic. So you're probably seeing less strong growth in dividends. So companies are more inclined to say hold the dividend and then send, spend the surplus on buying their own stock back. Mm -hmm. So I do think, good question, I think essentially in the short term, you're seeing slower dividend growth with that surplus capital more focused towards buybacks. Now that dynamic changes, that is a dynamic because companies perceive their own equity to be very undervalued. So logically, why would you not retire very cheap equity? It's good for your cost mm -hmm. of capital mm -hmm. and it makes a lot of sense. And certainly shareholders have liked it because obviously that's helped in terms of their own their own fund flow perspective. It would change if equity markets revalued and fixes weren't so cheap. So if, if companies then became more fairly valued, we'd logically see um, a return to dividends over buybacks. But at the moment, you know, I think it is correct that we are seeing slightly more priority given to buybacks over dividends. I don't think it's a, I don't think I don't think it's a, a long term thing, but certainly it's currently currently very much in vogue. All right. It, it will is it ever likely to reach a point where you're going to have to sell shares to generate income rather than uh, just take uh, the yield from your investee companies? I don't I don't think I think there's a very strong dividend culture in UK corporates. I don't think they're going to be cutting dividends. I, I don't think companies are cutting dividends to mm. fund mm. buybacks. They're literally just not growing the dividends as fast. And using that surplus capital to buy back stock, so I don't perceive, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't perceive a time when we're suddenly going to be in a situation where our dividend income will fall rapidly and it will be buybacks. That's not what what I see for the forecast. Okay, um, Adrian Coles would like to know: Do you continue to hold shares after the company grows out of the smaller category, um, whatever you define as smaller? Do you have a maximum yeah, size that's... of company you you invest in? Again, very good question. So um, in terms of new investment ideas, they very much are all within our market cap band. And we, our benchmark is the Deutsche Numis Small Companies Index. That's the bottom 10% of the UK market by market cap. I said before, that's about any company below one and a half billion market caps. So it goes halfway up the mid 250. Mm -hmm. um, we can continue to own those companies uh, beyond that. So if we buy something and it does really well, and there's a, quite a few companies in our portfolio in that kind of bracket, we can continue to own them and around around 20% of our portfolio is companies that have grown beyond our market cap scale because um, we still like them and they're doing really well and why we sell them. But we do have a natural cutoff point. So when a stock goes into the FTSE 100, we have six months to sell it. And we've had a number of companies over the years make that transition and, and grade. The most recent example was Howden, the kitchen retailer and manufacturer, which I think went to FTSE um, uh, end of last year, end of yeah, 23. Um, so it's not it's not common, but, you know, we do get that. So if there's a natural cutoff point. You know, we're not, we're meant to be a smaller company's portfolio. We're not meant to own a, a kind of raft of FTSE 100 companies. Yeah. So we yeah. have a natural cutoff point, but we can run our winners um, to a certain extent. Right. Okay. Thank but you. New, uh, new, sorry, new ideas very much in our core area. 
Okay, thank you. Um, right, we've still got a few coming in here, so we'll we'll try and keep these quick. Uh, do these quickly. We're already uh, three minutes to go. So, uh, given the interest in dividends, do you have any positions in small cap oil and gas names? Yeah, we do. We have um, four oil and gas companies in our portfolio. We've got Harbour Energy. We've got um, Seric Energy. We've got um, Hunting. And my memory escapes me. So we do invest in oil and gas. Um, you know, you know, for two reasons. Obviously, clearly, you've got that income stream from and cap. So Capcom was the last one. Remember, we do, yeah. we do, we do like that they're obviously paying high dividends. Um, but we do like the essentially the growth dynamics of them, but also the hedge it provides us, because clearly, you know, look at the you know period of time when during COVID, when the UK gas price spiked materially, Sarah could perform very well because it's UK gas producer. Um, so you know it's right for us to have some exposure in that space because oil prices can be very volatile and be quite, you know, geopolitically influenced. Um, so yeah, we do find some interesting opportunity in, in the oil and gas space. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Peak. he wants to pay you a compliment. He says you've aged incredibly well. Thank um, you, Stephen. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if you know him personally, but there you uh, go. I, uh, again, ex-colleague. I, I, I've got oh, a, few right. more gray, a few more grey hairs than you, me, Stephen, basically. So and certainly the last two or three years, I've put, put a few more on my head as well already. But, 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 um, okay. Well, he's inquiring, he's inquiring about when you, when, when will you or the, and the directors start thinking about succession planning? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a bit harsh. I, I, well, I, there I, you go. I mean, that's putting I, I, you on the spot. Well, um, I am. I am fifty-six. I've got a few more years left of me, hopefully. Um, well, if you're I'm, still enjoying it, um, exactly. Yeah, no, it. I, so, totally. No, look. I mean, I, I've, I, mean, I, you know, clearly, I'm towards the end of my career. And I started my career. Um, I've done this job for twenty-two years at uh, at Janice Henderson. Um, I'm in no kind of um, you know, to go quite yet. I've still got um. Got four boys. I've got um, two at university, or three at university actually. So I've still got a few fees to pay. So I still need to keep uh, keep it employed. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. But I think you've got a very strong team there. So clearly, obviously, I mentioned Indri, um, who, who's a deputy in the trust. She joined back in 2013. You know, she's very, very capable, very good, and we've got a good lot. You know, good sort of set of individuals around me. So look, I mean, absolutely, succession is very much on the view. Five foot under a bus tomorrow. I'm sure the. The board's got a very clear view as to you know how we go forward and that, but uh, at the moment, um, there's no plans to leave. Okay, so if Stephen was thinking of applying for the role, he, he should uh, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> He's welcome to give it a go. <laughs> okay, um, there you go, Stephen. Hope that answers your question. Um, Adrian Cole, so uh, oh, Adrian's getting depressed about AIM now. So there is no point to the AIM now? Question mark. I don't. <laughs> But, no, look, I, I think mean, you no, give no, a balanced answer on that. I think but, I, I, hopefully I'll, I'll give balanced answers to everything. I think there's look, there's still tax relief. Might yeah. be your name. Um, it was forty. It's now twenty. That's obviously less attractive. Um, you know, in in the round, is that enough of a tax break for investors to to have the volatility of owning AIM shares? Yes and no. I think it's it's clearly less attractive than it was. I mean, you can't. You can't, you know, you can't change that kind of that kind of dynamic. I mean, the Labour have half the t the tax advantage of being an AIM stock from an IHT or BPR perspective. Right. So at, at the margin, it's got to be a less attractive market going forward. Yeah. But it yeah. still has a place. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I would concur with that. Uh, um, Paul, uh, one of says one of your outliers for poor performance is impacts asset management. Mm. This is not too far out of kilter with other UK asset managers. Um, what catalysts do you believe might result in this sector re-rating? Flows, flows, flows. Um, asset managers are hugely dependent on flows. Um, you, know, you know, fundamentally that drives, you know, their their kind of their assets under management, and then they charge fees on that. And clearly, obviously, a higher AUM means higher fees, means higher profits. Uh, flows in from conventional asset managers and impacts is one, but clearly it's across the piece have been you know pretty negative the last two or three years um so the fundamental catalyst for impacts is per share price performance improving is flows okay thank you and uh, uh finally uh we're, we're kind of out of time so i'll just deal with this last one actually i think you've already answered this uk market trades at low pe multiples when will we see uk small cap multiple re-rating upwards what are the drivers for this re-rating and will this be driven by macro or micro fundamentals i think you alluded to that on one of your slides really did you I want to add I, anything more to that 
not really no i think it's um yeah i think you know there's i've given lots of catalysts by the uk market can yeah can re-rate yeah. potentially and i think again why small caps can do as well yeah so uh just uh for anybody who's uh, still wondering about that do look at the recording which will be posted on our site shortly and uh the pack the presentation pack and i think it'll rejig your memory if you missed that particular set of comments from neil so um Without further ado, um, I think we'll move on because it's already gone to six o'clock. So thank you, everybody, for staying with us. And thank you, Neil, for your presentation today. That was very interesting and uh, lots of good stuff there for people to chew over. So uh, thanks very much and look forward to seeing you again in the near future. Um, wish yeah. you well with your portfolio management and your four uh, kids at university. Abs <laughs> Absolutely, Michael. Thank you for your time and everyone this afternoon. And Thanks for the curveballs, my, 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 my former colleagues as well. So um, much appreciated. Okay. Bye <laughs> Thanks for now. a lot. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye-bye.